So we started that as uh, as a tribute to how heavily um, um, heavily important our improv elements mean to us. With our very first album in 2008, we started that Shiner series. So we've mixed in improv before. We, we, we've gone into the studio and said, okay, we're paying for the studio time, but we trust ourselves so much that we're willing to go ahead and risk and gamble and see what we get. And each time, we wound up walking away with something we were happy with. So this time, we decided... Let's do a whole album like that, and maybe it'll just yield one piece that's releasable. Maybe we, we won't put it out. And we went in, and ultimately the session that, that yielded CCXMD actually yielded a second album. There's, uh, oh, I, really? I can say now, you know, not to break the news, but I mean, <laughs> I, I, I imagine that like, you know, 12 to 18 months from now, we might be talking again, mm. because there's definitely CCXMD2. Uh, the session that we wow. went in to, to work on this material wound up it, it, it just wound up like white hot on fire. We were really happy. And it started off with us just kind of talking with the instruments. And then the second part of the session, later in the night, we started to like discuss like, well, why don't we try to do something that's this vibe? Or why don't we attempt to create this? So we really wound up with, with a wealth of material and we edited it down and we even cut some of some songs that were like it was hard to tell which ones were really just mm, but we we cut it all the way down and still by cutting it down, we have this album and there's another album of material. So okay. um, we felt strongly enough about it that, you know, after thinking on it for a while, we decided, yes, let's let, let's move forward and have the next uh, the next album in our series, in our catalog, in our overall, you know, like, uh, you know, uh, ongoing um journey uh, let's have it be this material let's have it be the stuff that was created in the moment that's entirely vulnerable that is not polished that makes a statement that for us it's us saying like we're done playing by any rules uh we don't want to be a part of anyone's little scene in a vacuum we don't want to be a part of like you know the people who are like hoping they get added to some local show for the big band coming through town and yeah. being friendly with the, the booker and trying to beg people to do this and trying to like purposely make an album sound like this. And it's the heaviest thing. And because we're just done doing what everyone else has done a million times. Like we right. can't waste any more time. Like life is way too short. And, and the thing, the thing that really clicked for us a few years ago is when we realized like, Oh, we're no longer doing the band with the goal. Like we're doing the band because of the um, because of the therapeutic value of the band. That's when things clicked. That's, That's I mean, I, I would say it was after that Black Flag tour that we quit our jobs for. That we we played all over and we did bigger shows than ever. And of course, that helped us to meet some other people and open some other doors. We've done like six European tours. We've, wow done a bunch of stuff that we're really thrilled to have gotten a chance to do. But I mean, what happened was somewhere as like some of those quote unquote, slightly bigger fun things were happening for us. We realized like, Oh yeah. Like nothing. It's not like you go through a doorway and everything changes. Once you've done some kind of thing, you don't hit a plateau and things are different. It's just life, you know? So that's yeah. when we started to realize, Oh, we, we're not doing the band to get someplace. We're doing the band to make being here on earth bearable. And that's when it was like, oh, okay, cool. So we don't got to worry about like when we're going to have this happen in our career or when that's going to happen. We're just going to do this. And once we started to just do it, that's when like it, it's just started to really be a loose fitting garment. It really started to feel comfortable. And that's when, you know, going ahead and making a record a, 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 in without a plan you know, laboring over whether or not we felt it was strong enough coming to the realization it was as strong or stronger than anything else we did yeah. and proudly putting it out is uh, is a really happy place to be in. And and behind the scenes, as we speak with this album just about to come out, not only do we have a second album in its series, but we're also working on another collaborative affair uh, oh my behind the scenes. Yeah. Yeah. There's uh, a gentleman named Thor Harris who um, plays in numerous bands. Swans uh, is one of the bands that he okay. plays in. I was going to say, that uh, he has, sounds familiar. Yeah, I mean, you know, I, I, you consult Google, um, <laughs> and it, it, it'll yield the results. Uh, I don't know. He might have He might have done a short stint in Circus Circus, but uh, hmm. you know, the week that, now we're beating a dead horse. So you're not that. sure. You're not, you're yeah. not sure. <laughs> I'm not going to have to consult it. Google. Yeah. Um, <laughs> but, but you know, but, you bring up a couple of points in in in, in what you just said, and uh, it it really threw out a, a couple of questions for me. 
and, sure. and they're kind of all over the place. So I'll try to get Hit through me. them here. Now, yeah, yeah. All right. So you you said, and, and you've said this in the past that that uh, cinema cinema show to you, it's it's kind of an exorcism of sorts for you guys. In listening and seeing some clips and hearing the new album, it's intense. Mm. Are there times, and you tour a lot, are there times for you when it's really hard to summon the energy to do a, a live show with the intensity that, that you record and, and that a lot of people are expecting that when they see a cinema cinema show? Yeah, I'm going to say, and this might sound, uh, you know, like, uh, I don't know how it sounds, I, not there hasn't been a time yet that when it when it's quote unquote go time and like time for us to go ahead and do the thing that it doesn't absolutely snap crackle pop and flip out i mean paul and i are so thrilled to play with each other i i can tell you uh there's been numerous times when we're on the road where the level and amount of travel that we had just done for instance we had played in uh, August of 2016. We were in Europe doing a handful of small festivals. We were playing the G7 Festival in Hamburg at oh, Ganga Vertel, this really, really amazing, amazing artist commune space. It's huge. It's a, it's a large circle uh, within these this this multi-house structure, building structure. That it's just it's it's hard to describe. The story isn't about describing it. It's about the 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 time lapse of scenario that happens. So here we are. It's Saturday night. We're playing in Hamburg. Now, I'm sorry, it's Friday night, we're playing in Hamburg, and Saturday night we're due to play in Vienna, Austria. Vienna, Austria, the drive from Hamburg, Germany, to Vienna, Austria is monstrous. I'm going to say it's likely anywhere from 9 to 11 hours. I wow. can't really recall. And we're in such a scenario that we have no choice but to do the gig in Hamburg, which we're one of the main bands on, luckily, and we're playing really late, and then just get in the vehicle and drive straight through to Vienna, uh, which, you know, we had done stuff like that in the past. But I, I tell you, we did that drive and we got to Vienna and we had all of about three or four hours to just kind of sit in the in the resting apartment that we had to crash in before we had to go to the venue in vienna and play oh and God. paul and i yeah paul and i looked at each other um uh, with just like this look of how are we gonna do this yeah like like dude i can't even i can't even think right now <laughs> i can't and 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 i'm telling you that night was one of the greatest gigs in our history wow um and there's also i mean flashback to any of those that European tour that I'm talking about all the European tours that we go on what always happens is this we'll fly out of America on Thursday just say on Thursday night five o'clock America time okay. we'll land Friday morning on what feels like 1 a.m. but ultimately it's 7 a.m. in Germany right, so, yeah. boom, and then we'll wind up having to travel a bit that day never having slept and do the gig that night and I mean, this is just like these are just examples of 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 time and and how that travel could kind of weigh you down. But I could tell you now, in each and every one of those gigs, we wind up summoning up that same thing because our view is we have got to play every single gig like it could be our last. And any band that doesn't do it that way, what the hell's the sense of going to see them? Period. That's that's how I take it. I've as a fan, I've seen thousands of bands. As mm -hmm. a musician, actively, I've played with thousands of bands. And I guess it, it would be easy to say this because it's my band. But I'll tell you now, I have not seen that many other bands that go up there and walk to walk, talk to talk, deliver the goods, and act as if it's the only fucking thing that matters in that moment. Yeah. Other than what we do, I'm well, telling you now. In the I'm sorry to have seen... dropped an expletive. I don't know if I'm allowed to curse on this. You, you you're show. allowed to do whatever you want on this. I've show. been trying to be good, but <laughs> uh, you know, like I, I can tell you this: just the excitement of playing music gets us so uh, amped up, and doing it together. And having done it for as long as we have, it's just this celebration. So, yeah, I don't know how, but we do deliver the energy. I can, I can say confidently that I'm not really worried um, about any of the, the 450 or 500 shows. I know that every one of them we both gave every single thing that we could. And that's one of the things I believe that leaves us as a mark on people's um, 
uh, memories. Uh, if they only saw us once, generally, if, if they caught the right night or the right part of the set or they were open-minded enough, they're usually looking forward to seeing us again. Or they couldn't stand it and they never want to see us ever. <laughs> There's well, also that, the, yeah, you know, so... I, I've heard that from some other bands. It's, it, it's, you know, I mean, it's, that's just the nature of music. But in the clips that I have seen, it is an intense show and one that I'm dying to catch. So I've got a few, a bunch of more questions here. If, if yeah, long, please go ahead. As long as we have time, I know you you had come up with a couple, and I and and I, I want to get to everything you got. I'm a talker, and I kind of go off nope. of my tangents, but no let me problem. get out of the way and, and and hit me with what you got. All right, so in the, on the new album, each song kind of flows into the next one. It, is it, was that on, I don't want to say on purpose, because you kind of explained how it happened, but did you spend a lot of time in the studio, and, and did you edit it that way on purpose? Because it kind of sounds like, uh, almost like, a, it flows almost like a Pink Floyd album, like a Dark Side of the Moon, where one song just kind of, slowly morphs into the the next song there there several songs there's just not a clear cut off they just kind of morph into something yeah. else and it's it's a, a fantastic effect on the album well i i love that you noticed that uh, great i could tell you now that uh we, we come away with that that whole theme of having that that pink floyd-esque type of like they the songs could bleed into each other that's something that's been really based deep in the core of our band since to start because uh, of our approach live and now our approach live also this also plays into how much improv is such a big part of things with live that's what we do with our set we don't like start do the first song and then it's over and and we wait for you to clap and then i say hey everybody it's <laughs> nice to be here tonight in the twin cities hello uh, cleveland yes. yeah exactly um so and then we do the next song stop wait for you to clap. we do we do not do that pity we, comment we go on you know, we let everybody know that we're thrilled to be there and, and, you know, and prep up and then we go and we get in. And from the first song to the last song, there isn't silence. We weave them together with these improv segues. Uh, so uh, a la some weird, long, winding, Grateful Dead jam where they're like touching on four different songs and winding up back in the first song. Yeah. Although it's, not, although it's nothing like the Grateful Dead, but just to use <laughs> no. it as a point of reference. Uh, but uh, so essentially, when we first started making albums, we had a very, very, very deep um, kind of yearning to translate that um, overall one program of music type of feeling to the albums. We've been trying to achieve that with almost all of the albums. Um, you know, sometimes it, it comes out just right, sometimes not. Uh, this new one, we definitely paid, uh, paid, we paid attention to the sequencing, and I could say that Songs two and three uh, on the record, uh, as I'm, I know that you've listened to the whole thing, I believe song oh, yeah. two is, is Cyclops, Cyclops and song three is Revealed. Yes. That was actually one entire piece. Oh, wow. Uh, if, if, yeah, when you next time you listen to that song, or for any of the listeners out there, um, that was one entire piece. And there's this there's this kind of cut part where it's like, do, 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 pop. Mm -hmm. Do, pop. Like, and that do, 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 pop. We cut right there and made that the end of Cyclops. Okay. And then the du, 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 pa, like the kind of you know again I'm 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 very doing a very bad impression of, of a drum beat. <laughs> um, but <laughs> Paul would be a lot better. We should get Paul on to do Paul that here. But um, then the uh, the the re revealed is essentially the second half of Cyclops. It was a song called Cyclops Revealed. Yeah, that was when we first edited the songs down. That was that was that one was going to be called Cyclops Revealed. And then upon further listening, we realized, oh, as one song, it's about eight and a half minutes. Uh, as two songs with this interesting stop in the middle, it's one's three and change and one's five. And you yeah. know, there's you know, there's that. So uh, you know, like that's a little insight to that why how that would sound really seamlessly in terms of cut. The other songs. We definitely, uh, we definitely paid attention to which batch of songs we were going to put together on this, uh, on this collection because we know there's a second album coming. So mm -hmm. we kind of like, 
went through the stuff, took a look at the session, see, so we saw which songs kind of were done near each other in the session that have a natural flow and rhythm of how they came out of us. Okay. Uh, and I think we kind of looked to group those together a little bit. So I think that there's a, a flow to the album because uh, we, we were creating, um, you know, like those vibes uh, kind of – all right around the same area. Uh, like I'd say that, okay. that this album kind of constitutes most of the first half of the session. Um, and the second album that'll come out in time kind of constitutes the second half. So the, um, the, the, the blending together, the overall kind of one long program thing, that is something we're always aiming for. It's based on our live performance, but on this album, particularly, we definitely combed through the stuff and whatever pieces kind of were similar to that, Mm -hmm. Like uh, maybe it was one piece that we cut into two. We tried to make sure the sequence reflected that. So okay. it would be a, a, an overall program that played well as opposed to like just a bunch of songs. Oh, OK. And because I'm, I'm listening to and it, it, like I said, it flows really well. The whole thing, it, it's it's really cool. It's kind of like uh, like Mars Volta meets Jethro Tull or like. A, a, oh, that's awesome. That's awesome. <laughs> or, or like a, maybe like a, like a. Really shouty first generation King Crimson. Oh, that's I'm yo, I'm I'm loving what I'm hearing, man. Thank you. That's very nice of you. I like all that stuff. Oh, that. is the, is the second album to come out? Is it a similar vein or is it different? Uh, I would say it definitely has some different um, some different atmospheric um, textural stuff. Okay, this one might have. Um, is, maybe some more of the aggressive moments um okay. Ooh, okay. I, I think the next one has some interesting kind of uh left turns and some little more outside noise and some of the more quiet moments that we've ever achieved that i think ah. we that's the thing when, when you're kind of when 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 you're a band like us and and as we describe as you mentioned how we've been described rather than me just self-professing <laughs> but as we've been described mostly you've used words metal and punk and experimental and you know scary and bearded i don't know what was used <laughs> Gypsies. but i mean uh basically when, when, when you're for the most part known as kind of heavy wild and, and, and nuts you know relying on the distortion pedal i i, I have a huge i have a huge pedal board and there's like two distortion pedals and there's a bunch of everything yeah. because i, I, I want to ask you about that of, but yeah, but but like, you know, we found, you know, like relying on that, um, you yeah, know, feels good, feels good to flex the, the, the volume muscles. But we hadn't uh, yet in the studio gone a lot of places where we could conjure an, a deep intensity with uh, without like just let's go to the distortion here or let's right. go to the big crashing thing here. So I think uh, there's uh, there's an interesting element of um, some quiet intensity that we achieve on this recording and on, on the, the up on the on the sequel uh, that we haven't gone to yet. So I think that's uh, that's even more interesting for us to reveal some more uh, vulnerability and um, some more areas where rather than rely on the, um, you know, like like the blowfish when it's, it's worried, it like it expands. Yes. You know, like it, yeah. it goes from this little thing to like the big blowfish, With the big you know, like as a duo, you know, you wind up, you know, uh, we're a duo and we generally get lumped in with other heavy bands that we play with. So we wind up doing the blowfish thing. Like we go on stage and people are like, what are they going to do? And then we literally, you know, melt your face and, you right. know, and run, and run a, uh, run a lawnmower over your soul. <laughs> you know, I mean, so, uh, you know, for us to get in the studio and decide like, okay, let's try to get to those places without just automatically being barbaric. I think that's what we're, we're really interesting in, interested in, in uh, the stuff that we explored and the stuff that'll be on the next, um, the next CCXMD album. Well, if I can make a suggestion, perhaps uh, one of those songs that they haven't been titled yet could be called Circus Circus. You know what? We this, it's clearly going to wind up playing into this. There's clearly, clearly that reference is going to bleed in moving forward. Attributed to the Performance Anxiety Podcast, 100. percent For those now, for those of us who don't live or are not from the Brooklyn area, can you tell me what a Gowanus flower is? Ah, a Gowanus flower is a rare, rare, uh, non-existent, uh, <laughs> mythical, mythical. Aesop fable, uh, you know. I mean, it's uh, uh, like essentially <laughs> the Gowan, the Gowanus uh, area of Brooklyn is a neighborhood that sits upon the Gowanus Canal. Uh, the Gowanus Canal, uh, again, 
people out there consult Google. It's the most um, polluted, miserable, fetid, disgusting, uh, dumped in, dead body, floating, <laughs> oil slick <laughs> housing, toxic waste, revealing, um, oh. you know, body of water that exists. The Gowanus Canal is absolutely bubbling over and green. Oh. Um, so we have a lot of experience down in the Gowanus because uh, in 2012, and with that green water I just spoke of, because in 2012, Hurricane Sandy was its name. Mm -hmm. It was the first hurricane in my lifetime to uh, bewilder and demolish um, of many portions of the neighborhood that I call home Brooklyn. Yeah. We don't really, I mean, at this point now, obviously in, you know, 2019, uh, and we already had data then we all know climate change. This isn't a podcast about that, but obviously <laughs> that's a major thing. We could spend five podcasts on that, but at the time, you know, going back eight years, of course, you know, you, you we all we all had heard and knew about climate change, but being like New Yorkers and hearing like a hurricane was coming, it was just like, who are you? What are you? What are you kidding me? Yeah. Like, well, well, where's forget your hurricane about it. coming? Yeah. Forget about your hurricane. Where's your hurricane coming from, Bubby? <laughs> you know, like I mean, we, we we just like we did not believe a hurricane could come. So I mentioned this because. We had a practice space in the Gowanus area of Brooklyn. Uh, we uh, it was we were banned for you know this is we whatever this is in 2012 when they when it was destroyed. Um, we were sharing it with a band called the Giraffes. Uh, uh, really, former podcast uh, guests. Yeah, oh, you know what? When I was dipping through the uh, your your page earlier, I saw that you had Aaron. Yeah, uh, and he is an absolute marvel. He is oh my amazing. God. He is a hero. He is the bomb. He is great. His and stories his are amazing. He, he's great. You got to go if, if you haven't listened. Go back and listen, everybody, because it's uh, there's stories about getting defibbed on stage and getting shot in the leg. It's just incredible. Yeah, and I tell you now, moreover, listen to his stories, but listen to his band, too. The giraffes yeah. are amazing. We, we were sharing our space with the giraffes, uh, and Hurricane Sandy hit right around Halloween of 2012. The space was in the Gowanus, literally on the block that sits right on the main part of the canal. Okay. Um, we didn't believe the hurricane could do much damage. We didn't take our gear out of the studio as it was going to hit. We just left everything there, and then the hurricane hit, and it was massive. And we heard from the owner of the space uh, a day after the hurricane saying, you guys need to come down tomorrow. There's been a, a flood. Um, more or less everything is destroyed. Oh. So, uh, yeah, we went down to our space. And again, uh, the hurricane rocked our, our part of town. So many people lost homes. Many people lost things that were a lot more uh, exclusive to living your daily life than instruments, which are just objects and replaceable. Don't get me wrong. As I said earlier, the therapeutic value of the band is why we're in it. It was not fun to fish out these tools of our trade, but they right. were just objects. But that said, in Gowanus, we suffered that. That same day we fished that stuff out. We met Martin BC, who I mentioned at the top of this podcast, yep. a producer who's had a studio in the Gowanus area for 35 years. He didn't suffer too much damage uh, via that hurricane, but he was walking around his neighborhood just to see who else had suffered damage and if he could help anyone. We noticed him. We had a conversation with him that led to our relationship with him present day. So in Gowanus, that uh, natural disaster bred this flower uh, of experience where – we lost all our stuff and realized that they were just it was just objects. We had uh, many of our friends who were bands at the time, Bandy, around us, help us out, donate gear to us so we could keep on going wow. till we rebuilt the gear. We met the producer who would produce our next two albums. Uh, it was just like a lot was bore from that. And it just so happens that at the time, we wrote a song about it called Gowanus Ghost. And that appears on our 2014 album called The Night of the Fights. Right. Uh, when we were recording this new album uh, and we were working on the piece that's called O2 Guana's Flower, it didn't have a title yet. It was just uh, a piece that we really wanted to achieve a real stirring emotional intensity uh, through almost like a guided meditation, um, uh, uh, walking through a hallway of, of just whack, insane, anything goesness. Um, 
Um, so if anything goes, this could be a term. But it at is the now. end of that song, it is now. But at the end of that song, um, I started to call upon lyrics from Gowanus Ghost uh, in Ode to Gowanus Flower. So uh, after the song was committed to tape and we went back and listened to it and I recognized that the name of the song was going to be Ode to Gowanus Flower, it was really kind of our, our uh, wrapped up um, feeling about that area and um, the stuff that's gone on. And yeah, a flower does not grow in Gowanus just like, a, uh, you know, like they wonder if a tree grows in Brooklyn. You know, I mean, it's just a, it's along that same kind of thing, baby. You know what I'm saying? A tree does grow in Brooklyn. Uh, and flowers do grow all over, but the, the Gowanus flower is a, a rarity, a sewage drenched, <laughs> toxic, glowing <laughs> rarity. Well, that's a much better story than I was. Exp- I was afraid it was going to be like the uh, like the Aerosmith Coney Island whitefish story. <laughs> I'm not sure of that, but I just heard Arrowsmith, Coney Island, and Whitefish, and now I don't know if we have time for you to tell me that story, <laughs> but if we don't, then off mic later, please impart it to me. Anything involving Steven Tyler, Joe Perry, Whitefish, I mean, is Joey Kramer there? I don't know. Oh, I'm like, I... It's that's deep. It's it's <laughs> it's not as deep as a story as it sounds because all the the title is a reference to the all the uh, used condoms that would wash up on the shore of Coney Island. Oh, okay, 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 okay. <laughs> so that's now you tie me, and now this is a lot more Steven Tyler sensibility. Yeah, <laughs> now, you know, like this is the guy. Like I remember, like when I was a kid. Watching the decline of Western civilization, part yes. two, which uh, you know, like tracks the Sunset Strip and what's going on there at the time. And Aerosmith, I think, are like freshly clean and sober when they're shooting it, like if they're like kind of crashing and burning. But they're definitely like the biggest rock stars at the time that are in the movie. They're like the elder statesmen. Yeah, and Megadeth and is starting oh, to Megadeth. descent. Yeah, yeah, M- 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 Megadeth. Uh, I mean, there's, 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 there's a lot of interesting and and, and stuff in that, and in yes. the decline of Western civilization, part one, but. I remember Steven Tyler's like pull quote was like the younger bands, they're into jerking off. Us, we're into fucking. That's what I think. I think that was Steven Tyler's big line in that movie. I, I watched it. I was ten. I was eleven. God. I'm like, this guy's nuts. You I know? gotta like, look at that. So, I don't remember that. I've got to check that out again. Yeah, it's check it forever. out. I'm telling you, it's gonna sound just like it sounded when I said it a few seconds ago. Like what? Oh yeah, that's God. what he says. All right, God so, bless him. You use a lot of pedals. Yes. Are you constantly buying them, or are you, is your setup pretty much where it's going to be? Uh, well, uh, similar to how you know, like we the the, the sound and our approach and, and our style and our genre continues to reveal itself to us. Uh, the journey with the pedals is one that kind of um, was an exploratory one. You know that I that I went uh, that I dove into out of need at first. Mm-hmm. I didn't like kind of grow up thinking like I'm going to be the the pedal guy. You right. know, like <laughs> definitely didn't think that. I mean, when Paul and I started playing, and we realized like, oh wow, we really feel good playing together. We'd like to primarily keep this as just the both of us. That's when I realized I was going to have to conjure up some more sound than just the basic guitar sound. I was going to need yeah. bottom end, so I was going to need an octave pedal. I was going to need to have some sort of mimicry of another guitar there at times. So I definitely was going to need a delay, maybe two delay pedals. I was probably going to need a loop pedal, although I didn't want to rely specifically on loops because they're very rigid and limiting. Mm -hmm. But I was just going to have to be able to call upon all those to continue to fill the spaces is is what I started to, to feel and see. So I went upon the journey of starting to build the pedal board. And at first it was just one pedal, then a second, et cetera. So it was kind of like keep on buying, keep on buying pedals for the first few years. I'd right. say by around 2011, about three years into the band, the the basis, the core of what the board is today was kind of born then. I mean, okay. the, the, currently, uh, the, my, my pedal board is actually being uh, re, re, rewired and retooled right now by uh, a really great musician and good friend of mine named Jason Wallenstein. He's a longtime friend of mine, an absolute amazing bass player. And uh, he works on pedals and works on other stuff, and he's just a good dude. He has my board because I'm prepping up to go on tour shortly, and it needed to be rewired, reworked, reconfigured. Also, my old pedal board, one of the um, one of the elements of the case was broken by the airline when we were flying from oh. Berlin to Manchester on tour last year. So I land in Manchester, UK, from Berlin, Germany, and my pedal board is basically broken open, and oh. then I have to – Results. I, I I I resort to 
duct, duct tape technology at that point. Like, oh, so then, then wow. it's like I become I become the guy who's just duct taping my pedal board yeah. closed. So it goes from like I look from like I look like a Mr. Super Sophisticated. Oh, look at the pedal board on this guy. What's he got? And then what I got is I got fucking duct tape. That's what I got. So uh, ultimately. I had to get away from the duct tape technology. So my buddy yeah. Jay Wall is doing the job on the board now and he's upping my pedal, um, uh, my board to 15 pedals. That's what I'm running nowadays. Wow. I, I've been running consistently a minimum of 12 pedals on the board since 2011. Uh, when I, when I could run everything I need, generally it's about 15 pedals. Um, wow. I, I do my best. I've done my best and I've learned like so many other things in this game, uh, of life. I've learned by doing and making mistakes, uh, what I've learned is that buying pedals that are, for the most part, um, readily available to replace, uh, like um, rather than boutique pedals, mm -hmm. and and you can you can get some amazing sounds out of all all the pedals. I'm not saying I'm anti boutique. Like I'm 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 all for anyone using whatever works for them. Um, but I've found that um, I use a lot of Boss pedals, and those happen to be available at guitar center or sam oh, yeah. no matter what city city or town or no matter what time of day i'm awake here in my town you know so um some of the kind of keystones of the board um are boss pedals that uh that i've broken two three four five times already over the last <laughs> eight years and i've replaced i generally like uh, certain ones like the boss oc3 octave pedal that i use for my bass tones yeah i usually buy those like two at a time i'll buy one <laughs> and put it on the board and i have another one for eventually because i'm also like i'm i'm also like the king of sweating i'm like this i'm, I'm like this, i'm a i'm a sweater of uh, a champion i'm a championship level sweat machine nice. so like I, i'm literally dripping you know, my, my, my spillage down onto my board while we're playing, the stuff gets rusty and shitty real quick. So, I mean, I try to, you know, like I've, I've learned to keep the board based around stuff that I could find and I could replace. Unfortunately, none of it is all that inexpensive. Uh, and it is the kind of thing when you with pedals where if you buy cheap, it's not going to last. I'm a big guy. I'm well over 200 pounds. I stomp on things. I'm mm. hard on, on all my stuff. I'm not thinking, let me step on this nicely when I'm playing. <laughs> when I'm playing, uh -huh. this is the key. I'm not thinking at all. That's why it's happening. So I wind up like finding that, you know, you can't just buy, I can't just buy cheap stuff because I break it. And, and, and like the, the durable, um, findable stuff is, is, is the best for me. So um, the pedal board grew out of necessity. I found uh, the sounds in it. I've done mix and match. I've made mistakes. I've peeled away pedals. I've had numerous times where I've had issues along the way as, you know, any, any, uh, any individual dealing with technology or anything like that, it sometimes doesn't want to agree with you. But yeah. uh, luckily, like, um, there's been enough times where I've been on my knees sweating profusely trying to make the thing work within like three minutes of having to go on and like <laughs> and finding that if I just stop, take a breath and start checking every single wire, like I'll always find the issue, you know. So it's just like kind of the kind of thing where it's like if you learn how to drive in a Porsche, then what happens when you don't have the Porsche? But if you learn how to drive in like a, a Plymouth Volari or a Dodge Dart, oh, then when you eventually have like a Porsche, like, you know, you can handle anything, you know. Yeah. So it's kind of like, you know, I kind of learned by making mistakes and I've had stuff break on me. I also had an instance when uh, another story that involves Hamburg, Germany, we get to Europe and the first show of the tour is supposed to be in Hamburg where we've had a lot of success and we're thrilled to be playing. The guy picks us up at the airport who's helping us out at the start of the tour and he's like, I have some bad news. The venue had an electrical fire and well, they can't host you tonight, but we have a different venue. And I say, cool, man, we'll play anywhere that we we can play thank you yeah and we go to the alternate venue and it's literally like a the smallest bar i've ever seen that has a tiny tiny back like area with a couch that's going to be moved and paul oh. and i are setting up oh. to play there and there's one point of power there's one outlet in the whole place <laughs> oh everything's plugged into it God. and i got to run an extension cord into it like a snake thing to oh. plug all my stuff in. So, and what happens is this, I plug all my stuff in and the second I plug it in and hit power on my board and everything, yeah, <laughs> all the lights, everything <laughs> in the whole club. And I, I'm sorry, everything in the mini tiny small bar that is making up for the club goes out. 
everyone everyone's computers their laptops oh like like God. lights everything <laughs> goes out and automatically i go from like the dude who's about to play to the villain yeah i go to this <laughs> who is this heel i pull a heel turn where suddenly like i am hated oh. and like and, and 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 my problem is I don't give a shit about what went out on you. My pedal board just fucking exploded. <laughs> and that's exactly what happened. Oh, my power no. surge strip thing that I had in my board burnt right then. <laughs> and I was stuck in this scenario where I had to ask the, uh, the gentleman who was, you know, I- involved in the tour. I mean, I, you know, he's a friend of ours and he works with us, but he's actually the tour manager. It feels kind of formal to tour- call him a tour manager. He's this great individual named Andreas who helps us out a great deal when we're over in Europe. But I had to, I said, Andreas, I- I'm in a bad spot. I need like 10 AA batteries right now. That's oh the only way gosh. I can make my pedal board work. And he's like, hang on, I will be right back. <laughs> and I don't know how this beautiful German <laughs> man did this. But within five minutes, he was back, and I was on the floor, to, you know, opening every pedal, sticking oh a nine volt in, God. and I had to, I had to run the board on. Ba- I was buying new batteries every day for that tour oh. just to get through it. Uh, <laughs> luckily, it was only luckily it was only nine shows, so it was only about fucking ninety batteries I went through because Jeez. they'd only last one night uh, until I got home and was able to fix the stuff. So. Oh my. God. Yeah, you you live and you learn, and mostly you learn what like uh, by being on stage and having the mistakes happen, with the lights shining on you and the sweat happening. You know, it's like you you can't ever be as prepared as you'd like to be, and when shit goes wrong, right at the moment when shit has to go right, it only prepares you better for all the next times. Well, it sounds like in a just an amazing time you've just had a an amazing time playing with your cousin and i've got one more question for you i know i've kept you quite a while here uh now nah, go for it man have you made it to all 50 states yet <laughs> thank you for that question oh that's a killer it's a killer because i mean first of all we've come to realize that hawaii and alaska will be um very much uh tasks in and of themselves we're realizing now that in in order to do alaska it seems kind of like we'll have to book a couple of shows in alaska it can't just be like we we strap alaska into the middle of a tour and and hawaii (laughs) is such a destination vacation scenario where we have found that there are diy spots down there but to, to dignify purchasing airfare to do a hawaiian show uh, we have to, you know, there has to be a greater good that makes sense. It could be in time because we do want to click off all 50 of them. But we're, I think we're firmly sitting at 41 right now. Oh, um, nice. or I'm sorry. It's either 39 or 41. Um, and you know, and that's, we owe a debt to having been on that black flag tour because some areas, for instance, North Dakota, South Dakota, Montana, um, those are ones that, you know, you don't just like wake up and you're on tour and you're there. Like, like suddenly I found myself in, in the Montana. middle of a, uh, Montana is an amazing, amazing, amazing state. I saw some of the most uh, deep, majestic beauty in those pla- those yeah. the Dakotas in Montana. Uh, you know, I mean, when I was there, it was it was during the summertime, and I was telling the locals how much I wanted to move there, and they were warning me at how vicious the winters were, and I was trying to warn them that I'm a I'm a New Yorker, nothing's vicious to me. <laughs> uh, but that said, um, some of the some of the states that were maybe a little bit harder for us to get to, we were lucky enough to to check off on that tour, and we and in that tour we were able to make good enough impressions that every one of those states are ones we do plan on going back to. We've gone back to many of them, but there's still we have to, many we have to do to work on. But yeah, we're still about uh, at least ten states short on the fifty uh, on the fifty state um, uh, checklist. Uh, but we have been lucky enough to be able to compile 11 countries That's um amazing. Ten, 10 countries outside of uh america so basically the story is like now we've done about 500 shows in 11 countries 40 of the 50 states in america that's how we spin it it sounds a lot better and more like <laughs> you know like more um you know like serious that yeah. way I, I, we we've we've been fortunate and um you know like just we found that not only does hard work really pay off, but hard work with, with a smile and hard work with a good attitude goes a really lot further of a way. Oh, That's yeah. the one thing that I could tell anybody who's about to do anything in any way, shape or form, artistic or otherwise. 
keep a good attitude. It's it's something that's appreciated by most and many. There's enough negativity out there. Don't hate oh, yeah. on what you're doing and don't like get like lost in your mind's vision of what it should be. Accept what it is and flourish inside that, you know? That's amazing. I love that. Thank you so cool. much for that. And if on the next tour, if you guys get down to, to Virginia, D.C., I got to catch you guys. Oh, done deal. Then we'll, we'll, we'll definitely see you. I mean, what's going on now to uh, to, to get us to it? Um, yeah, we have uh, we have mostly a West Coast Southwest run that's planned for November. Uh, the, the album CCXMD is going to happen November 1st. It, it's released uh, out into the world. Um, November 2nd, we have a what we consider to be kind of a warm up show in Pennsylvania. Okay. Uh, and then November 8th is when we hit California and, uh, the eighth is Baker Bakersfield, California. The ninth is Pasadena, California. The 10th is Reno, Nevada. The 11th is San Francisco, California. The 12th is Albany, California. It was supposed to be Oakland, but that fell through. There's an the Albany 13th, in California too. Wow. Yeah. I didn't know till just now. You got to hit all those cities yeah. though. The 13th <laughs> is Shadow Hills. The 13th is Shadow Hills, California, and Mike Watt and the Missing Men are playing on that oh, show with nice. us. Uh, nice. The 14th is in Fresno, and then the 15th we go to Texas. Uh, we go to Denton. The 16th we're in Dallas, and then we head back home. Um, and uh, we're in the middle, behind the scenes, of working on other new material. So we're going to be a little bit crafty and how we plan the next bit but right after we get past the cold bit of the holidays and into the new year we're definitely planning um a bit of regional stuff down your way nice so uh sometime by the spring uh march april area uh we're gonna do like the second blast of dates in association with the ccxmd album and we are undoubtedly going to be in the Virginia area area 100%. You'll see us. Beautiful. We'll see you. We'll shake hands. We'll hug. Yeah. It'll be real. Well, I'll tell you what. I will trade you some uh, some photos for uh, if you guys can swing a media pass or something. Cause Consider it done. I will shoot. And after we're done here, I will shoot you a couple pictures to show you I'm not full of shit. I actually studied photography in college, so. I'm holding you to that. I have a very high bar. I'm, I'm just, that was, I'm kidding around. Please <laughs> send whatever you can. Uh, I tell you right now, I don't even know where, when, or what yet, but it's going to happen and you can be guaranteed. Boom. We had a lot of fun. You're on the list. Awesome. It's on, it's on dude. Well, where can people follow you guys uh, on social media so they can uh, plan to come see you guys on tour and, and follow your Instagram, you have Instagram and Twitter. Yeah. And all that? Yeah. I, I'll, I'll give you all that stuff. Um, Cinema Cinema, uh, which is the name of the band. Uh, obviously, you know, if the name of your band is like, you know, Green Vanilla Fart, like you could probably, <laughs> you'd be extremely Googleable. You know, if yes. the name of your band is, you know what I'm saying? But like being that the cinema is something that you can go to anywhere and uh, et cetera, like uh, it's, uh, it, we, we just try to keep it simple. Just Cinema Cinema Band is basically where you could find us with almost anything. Uh, so if you go to cinemacinemaband.com, that's our website. If you go to Facebook and you go to facebook.com forward slash cinemacinemaband, that's us on Facebook. If you go to Instagram and you do the same thing, da, 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 forward slash cinemacinemaband, hey, that's us. The only place where we're just cinema cinema, I believe, is Twitter. Um, so, okay. I mean, yeah, we're, we're really kind of findable. In terms of uh, the socials, we do obviously engage in social media. We're not fans of it. I don't know, um, you know, how it really helps, but it does work in such a way that you can communicate things to people, whether they're yep. good or bad things and whether yeah. people hear them and understand them or not. That's its own conversation. But we are on the socials. We do post about what we do. We, we do go out and play music with the hope that people will come and join in the insanity and, and get in the moment with us. So you can check. Uh, we keep everything pretty fairly uh sharply updated um yeah the uh the new uh the new record will be available at all the shows uh, nefarious industries is the record label that we are on now uh currently they're putting out the album they have a lot of other really 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 great cool outside music a lot of bands that we very much respect zevius and bangladeshi and brandon uh seabrook um, there's just a lot of really, really ox is another band. Those darn gnomes. Uh, there's a lot of really great stuff on nefarious industries. Awesome. We're really, we're really excited to be working with them. It's a really comfortable fit. Um, and being that we have a lot of music, uh, kind of already in the can and most stuff we're working on, I think 
it's a it's a harmonious relationship, and we'll see how it progresses. I can definitely envision there being some other new release of ours uh, by late next year, and followed up by um, some more touring abroad. We're kind of due to get back out over to Europe. But now I'm starting to sidebar. I could go for another hour. I'm sure <laughs> you got what you need. Yeah, and I'm I, sure I, your listeners have, have uh, your listeners have literally overdosed yeah. on Ev Gold and Cinema Cinema uh-huh. to the point you might have to revive somebody. Or yeah, I, I don't know how you're going to draw them back in next week. I'm sorry mm-hmm. that I, I burnt it all up and we went so crazy. No, it's in, it was intense, just like the music. And I think we've come up with at least four song titles for the next uh, for CCM CCXMD two. You know, we got Circus Circus, we got Green Boom. Vanilla Farts, we got Spillage, Boom. and Anything yo. Goesness. Yo, yo, listen, when you send those photos for me to observe and and rate and judge, yes, uh, please send those song titles as well. <laughs> you got it, man. I'll do it right after we hang up. Sounds good. Man. Hey, man, thank you so much for coming on spending so much time with me. I really do appreciate it. It's been fantastic. My pleasure.